Welcome to On The Chain. This is Chip. Jeff is on special assignment. We're going to take a closer look. Is the SEC getting outsmarted by Ripple? And also, Ripple gains access to some SEC documents. We're going to talk about some more mass adoption. Bitcoin fever spreads. Let's go. Welcome to On The Chain. And welcome back, everybody. What is going on tonight? So I think there's a couple of interesting things we want to dive into tonight. I think one of the first things we want to take a look at is, is the Ripple outsmarting the SEC? What do I mean by that? Well, it just seems like if you look at some of the rulings, the way they've gone, and you know, last night we had John Deaton on here. If you didn't see it, you can go ahead and check it out. Um, last night it was fantastic. We had almost a thousand people here, and a lot of great questions. And you know, one of the things that happened earlier today, there was a um, there was a webinar that featured John um, Deaton and also Rosalind Layton. And we know Rosalind Layton because she has authored these phenomenal. Um, sort of, I guess, like critiques of the SEC, talking about the SEC making missteps, embarrassing themselves, and putting the whole agency at risk. And there's a little bit more of that on the call today if you didn't have a chance to listen in. John Deaton was on fire, as always. One of the most amazing things that he said, my takeaway was, at the very last part of the video, um, I guess there was a couple questions asked and answered, and it's something we want to jump into. But he had said, you know what? The XRPL is actually more decentralized than Ethereum. He goes, I wish I had time to go into it. It's probably a time that we'd have to cover, uh, you know, with more time. But it was great that he sort of dropped that because started thinking about that. And, you know, there's another story we're going to cover tonight as well, which goes into this whole thing of like Ethereum. Believe it or not, there's somebody out there that's trying to trial, believe it or not, a sort of a CBDC. Um, a digital form of a dollar, so to speak. I'll be very careful. I always say it, don't want to give it away. But what are they using? It's not XRP. It's not XLM. It's not Hedera Hashcraft. No, 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 none of those. And you think, well, what could it possibly be? Well, it's not what you think it would be. So I want to jump into some of this stuff right now. Um, James Phelan, as always, dropped a really good, um, you know, he dropped something today. And I'll let's share this here. Let's go. Here we go. Here we go. So let's go ahead and share this. Um, this happened. Look at this breaking news. This is right here. So last night, we Jeff and I were sort of speculating, you know, who could it be that the SEC was trying to squash? They were trying to um, quash, I should say. That's the official legalese. They were trying to quash um, a deposition of a certain SEC official. Now we see who that SEC official is. I originally said Hinman. It's got to be either Hinman or Clayton. And it turns out that it is William H. Hinman. Um, of formerly of the SEC, ex, he was the ex SEC director of the Division of Corporate Finance, and so this broke pretty. I think this uh, about five o'clock, uh, which is a couple hours ago, about three hours ago, this broke. And uh, as always, James uh, threw this up here, and I want to go to this tab right here. This is actually the letter right here that the SEC. Uh, I don't know if I can make this a little bit smaller. I should be able to, but let's see what we can do here. But this is a lot of documents, 82 doc, 82 pages right here. And uh, it's the normal thoroughfare, basically um, addressed to Judge Netburn. They, the SEC wants to go ahead and request uh, a court conference because they're seeking an order to quash the deposition subpoena directed to William H. Hinman, um, the former director of the SEC uh, Division of Corporate Finance, and blah, 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 blah. And um, and in the alternative, the SEC seeks an order to strike Ripple's fair notice defense. You guys see that they keep going after this fair notice defense, right? They're kind of scared about that. They keep, it's, you know, the SEC is telling you exactly through all of these motions, all these filings, exactly what they fear the most. And what do they fear here? Well, they do not want Ripple speaking at all. They don't want anywhere near former, you know, SEC uh, official William Hinman because, why would that be? Why do you guys speculate that might be? And look at Jeff right there. He's like, let's go. He's right here. Yeah. He's watching from afar, from a secret location, a secret bunker, if you will. And so there's there's got to be something going on that they just don't want to look at. But 
I don't. We're not going to go through this whole thing tonight. But what I do want to look at um, some of the main points. Director Hinman held a position of critical importance to the SEC operations. Bingo. Yes, I like that. Let's take that. That's uh, cue that up. Keeping track here too. Hinman has no firsthand knowledge of the facts underlying this action. Oh. Isn't this what you say when something goes wrong? You're like, oh, they don't know. They don't know anything about it. He, how would he possibly know? He was an SEC official. There's no way to have any knowledge of it, right? It's kind of almost as if like, oh, okay. Yeah, it doesn't sound guilty or anything. The subpoena should be quashed because the defendants cannot meet their burden of demonstrating exceptional circumstances justifying it. Uh, yes, they can. Uh, Director Himmins served as a high-ranking government official. Yes, that's why they want to depose him. Um, <laughs> defendants cannot demonstrate exceptional circumstances. They continue to go on. A lot of legalese. Uh, uh, it's just more of the same. They just go in more in depth. Uh, obviously, they um, will cite a bunch of other cases, you know, like the Village Hoffman Estates versus Flipside Hoffman Estates, blah, blah, blah. So they basically got to just show that there's some teeth behind what they're doing. Now, the exhibits are interesting here because here's one right here. There's the subpoena to testify for William Hinman. Um, the date and time, 630, 2021. That's coming up. So let's see. Are they going to be able to quash this deposition or is this going to happen? And coming up a little bit further here, we have got, uh, I hate to scroll these pages. I wish there was a better way to do this, but no. Then there's exhibit B here. And look at this. This is, this is, um, uh, declaration in support of uh, Platon's motion to quash defendant's deposition. Um, this is uh, against Triple Labs, Garlinghouse, and Larson. Blah, 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 blah. And there you go. See, now the funny thing about the pop is, is this is signed by Bill Hinman. So this is Hinman, his official declaration during my time with the division. I did not discuss the commission's investigation of Ripple, Larson, Garlinghouse, legal status. Yeah, but you know what he did discuss? You know what he has discussed, which is not, which is uh, speaking to an attorney friend of mine today. And he said, you know, he did discuss prior to that meeting, that, that announcement at the Yahoo conference, which we'll dive a little bit into because I want to talk about why Ripple might want to take a look at closer look at Hinman and depose him. So he's yeah, okay. Well, maybe he didn't know anything about the commission's investigation of Ripple. Uh, maybe he didn't know anything about Larson and Gar fair enough, but. That's not why they want to depose him. That's not why at all. And he talks about here. Talk here. He mentions the speech intended to express my own personal views, which he says right up front. But I'm getting a little tired of the, oh, let me go out and cause as much possible damage as I can. But don't worry. I prefaced it with anything Chip says tonight, not in the official capacity and role of an on the chain. So it's just it's it's a ridiculous sentiment. And. The fact that they're going after this and he's saying, well, the speech was intended to express my own personal views. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Hinman. Does anybody give a rat's behind what your personal views are? No, they don't. Do they care what Hester Pierce's personal views? No. The reason you get invited to these conferences is because you were a director and a high-ranking official with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Nobody cares about your personal opinion. Do they care if you like to smoke cigars on the weekend? Nobody cares. I mean, it's a fun tidbit. Do they care if you like to drink whiskey? I might. Nobody else cares. Looking further along here. So he gets blah, blah, blah. He signs off on that. Exhibit C. Here it is right here. The exhibit is here. Here's Hinman. Here's his remarks. Uh, the entire remarks at the um, SEC conference. Also have it here because it's in a better format. That one's on Dropbox. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to remove this and play a little bit of this for you so you just hear it. Let's kind of take a look at this. Let's look at what he's saying. We're not going to listen to the whole thing. We're just going to listen to a little bit of it. So let me throw this up there. Let me share it. Give me one second here. Oh, yikes. What is the name of this one? Uh, there it is. I believe this is it. Oh, no, that's not it. This is it. Uh, there it is right there. And let's see. Guys, you have to tell me in the chat if you can hear it because I don't have Jeff. Or Jeff can tell me in the chat. But I'm not going to be able to hear it. But I want to hear if indeed this is going on. Let's uh, let's make this a little bit bigger here. Let me know if you can hear this. It's a newsworthy event for you all. I have to be able to hear it too. Uh, something not so newsworthy. I'm uh, going to remind you that my remarks uh, are mine alone, uh, not necessarily those of the commission. 
Now, if you guys were able to hear that, basically what he said there is, uh, these are my own remarks, not of that of the commission. Then why? Siri doesn't understand, but why in the hell would you get invited to a conference as an SEC official, but you're going to get up there and say, well, anything I might say, it's just my own personal opinion, right? So hopefully you guys can hear it. Beautiful. So I'll play a little bit more of this and you can see sort of his demeanor. Now he says something really important here. Let's see if you guys can catch it. The commissioners or the staff. But this event gives us a great opportunity to address a topic that I think has been a, a subject of considerable debate in the press and in the crypto community. And that's whether a digital asset, a token, a coin, offered as a security can over time become something other than a security. Okay, so you, so could it become something other than a security? Well, it certainly could become something other than a security, right? But it's a pretty sensitive topic. Remember, this is 2018. It's almost two and a half years ago. Actually, it's three years ago, I believe, because it was on yeah June 14th. And what are we looking at? 24th. A little over three years ago. And he's giving a very sensitive speech, something we've been waiting a long time to hear about digital assets. And I think I missed the very beginning. I wanted to play that beginning part again. Yeah, let's just listen to what he says. It's a newsworthy event for you all. Uh, something not so newsworthy. I'm uh, going to remind you that my remarks uh, are- So it's a newsworthy event for you all, and maybe for some, not a newsworthy event at all. You know who it's a newsworthy event for? Us, you know who we are? We are the XRP holders. We're called investors. And you know what? I have a feeling this this uh, gentleman right here is going to get deposed. Now, he goes on and on and on. And we don't have enough time to listen to the entire thing. But one of the things that does happen in here, and we will kind of uh, highlight in text form, because I want to run through some of his remarks, is that Mr. Hinman, Mr. Hinman here, he's an official of the SEC, was invited to speak at Yahoo conference here. Let's throw this on here. And let's just uh, let's enlarge that, and let's do a search for ETH, right? And let's go. This works so much. There it is, right there. He says, so you know, when I look at Bitcoin today, I do not see a central third party whose efforts are a key determining factor in the enterprise. The network on which Bitcoin functions is operational, appears to have been decentralized for some time, perhaps from inception. Doesn't know. Um, applying the disclosure regime of the federal securities laws to the offer and resale of Bitcoin would seem to add little value in putting aside the fundraising that accompanied the creation of Ether, Ether. Based on my understanding of the present state of Ether, Ethereum network and its decentralized structure, current offers and sales of Ether are not security transactions. Ah, right there. There it is right there. There's the magic. Why? Because he's stating that at the present time, 2018, not 2014, when uh, uh, Vitalik Buterin had a sort of a sale and didn't distribute in 2014 in July and didn't distribute the coin until a following year later in July of 2015. That right there looked, smelled an awful lot like an ICO, initial coin offering, which guess what? Everybody who's come up against the SEC lost, right? But what he's saying right here, I think is kind of key because I think this is where Ripple's going to hang their hat on um, based on my understanding of the present state, right? Now, here's the weird thing based on the present state. Now, based on the present state of XRP, why did they come out and say that? This is something um, last night that John Deaton talked about saying, you know, that if if he has his shot at it, that's one of the things he wants to go in on a, some type of an oral argument. He wants to be able to say that why would come out right now and say today's present XRP is not a security because that's kind of where he's going on this right here. And he says, and with Bitcoin applying for disclosure regime of the federal securities laws, blah, 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 blah. So he says, I don't want, I want to like to emphasize whether that analysis of whether something is a security is not static and does not strictly adhere to the instrument, even digital assets with utility that functions solely as a mean of exchange in a decentralized network could be packaged and sold as a strategy that could be a security. Yeah, they could be, but more than likely, they're not even going to be anything like a security. So he goes on. I mean, it's a long speech. You guys can listen to it. You can read it. But I wanted to put that up there because I think this is what's really key. Now, how did he arrive at this? And, you know, talking to an attorney friend of mine, I guess there is some people that he reached out to to sort of get some input around this speech, right? And what did they say about 
um, not only digital assets, but Ethereum in general. Did they not know that Ether back in the day as a digital token, sure, looked like it could have been a security, sure, packaged up and sold like a security. So I think this is what they want to get at, communication. And you can kind of tell because the SEC is freaking out. And this is where I believe the Ripple is outsmarting. And it's not really necessarily Ripple, but it's the attorneys. They're seeing little cracks in the armor. They're seeing little dents. They're seeing the little faux pas and mistakes that the SEC is making. And that's one of the things that, that um, yeah, here we go right here. Buford T. Justice says Vitalik was selling ETH to finance the project before the network was finished. Absolutely. Then gave themselves large numbers of pre-mined ETH. Huh. Well, that's funny because that sounds very familiar. Now, it is different in the sense that with Ripple, and, and the key thing is, the key thing here is that Ripple, when they were gifted the uh, token or it was open coin, it already existed. They didn't mint it. They didn't create it. It was already done. Now, in the sense of with Vitalik, it's exactly right. They hadn't finished the network. That's why a whole year elapsed. And it was kind of like a fire sale. If you get in now, you can get it for, and I don't remember what the offer price was. Maybe you guys can throw it down there. But there was a set offer price. And they said, well, if you get in right now, you can get it at this price. So you kind of like pre-bought it, wasn't available wasn't ready now it's not your typical ico where you put up you know four million or 20 million or a thousand whatever whatever the the amount of coin is and then you sell it right that's your initial coin offering and you open it and it goes up and down and you go ahead and purchase that but sort of looks like that because it, you pre, did pre-sell it it was a year before it was actually distributed and it also was buford t justice right there pointed out that it wasn't finished yet and that's one of the things that they did so uh, that right there um just looking at what they looking at some other comments in here and so that's one of the things that i think that they, one of the reasons they want to go ahead and do that now ripple gains access to sec internal policy docs again more and more big wins here now, this was just published uh, very recently here. Let's see. So despite intense efforts made by the SEC, the court does grant Ripple discovery to SEC's internal docs. Earlier this month, Ripple filled out a request to the court, demanded the SEC uh, to public agencies policy for its employees engaged in buying or selling of cryptocurrency, including XRP. Well, isn't this going to be pretty interesting? You know, Jeff has brought this up a number of times. John Deaton brought it up a lot, right? John Deaton brought it up again last night, wants to know. It's a fair question. Did they or did they not go ahead and purchase it, right? What were the internal sort of governing stuff inside? Every organization has, you know, especially when you're dealing with a government body, you know, especially a regulatory body such as the SEC, um, you have a certain number of things you can do and you can't do. If you go out in public, there's certain things you do and you can't do, right? And a lot of the times too, they have a lot of restrictions and they have to be public depending on what your role is. So this right here is really fantastic because they want to know which of the employees did you buy, did you sell? And the response, SEC told the court that Ripple's demand to discover the SEC's policy regarding its employees, deal with crypto, should not be answered as it would not lead to the discovery of any relevant evidence. Now, time and time again, they tell you exactly what they're afraid of. Oh, it's just nothing. You know, it's kind of like, I remember years back, there was a, they would go into a country and they would a weapons inspector and say, you know, to make sure you don't have any bad weapons. So we stay in compliance. I go like, yeah, it's not a problem. You look anywhere. And they go like, how about over here? Not there. You know, it's kind of like someone comes into your house and says, you know, they have a warrant. They want to search your house. You say, sure, not a problem. But you can't, don't just don't look in that room over there. Of course, you know, don't look in the room. So it will not lead to discovery of any relevant evidence. Well, if it wouldn't lead to any discovery of any relevant evidence, then why not? Why aren't you okay with it then? If it's a nothing burger, say, hey, I don't care. Look at anything you want. We have nothing to lose here. So on the other hand, Ripple remained persistent, argued not only discovery would be relevant, but it also could help the firm prove Ripple's allegations that the SEC failed to provide the fair notice to the firm of the lawsuit. So again, they're tying back the fair notice because who was the failure to provide the fair notice? Not a Ripple. It's all about the SEC. So further, this could give insight to the SEC stance regarding the nature of XRP, 
whether or not the agency distinguishes it from other major cryptocurrencies, for example, Bitcoin and Ethereum. Further, the discovery could also prove lucrative for Ripple in regards to the Howey test. So you see that you see kind of see a little bit of the strategy here, what they're going after, right? Fair notice. What kind of employees? What was the what were employees at Ripple? What were they up to? What were they doing? Um, and then here you see that this is from Crypto Law, and this is John Deaton. He's one of the founders. Uh, Judge Netburn orders SEC to produce internal policies uh, governing employees trading in or purchase in the sale of digital assets, which the SEC has refused to do until now. So, yeah. And again, so you have to ask yourself the question, like, why are they refusing to do it? What is the big hang up? If you're not if you're not guilty, you're like, man, go ahead. No problem. Why not? I'm going to see if we can uh, open up this thread here. Let's pull this open and it says uh, the RFP number 26 in Netburn's order refers to the letter motion from Ripple's Brad Garlinghouse and Chris Larson of June 4th on Discovery Matters, uh, Section 2, SEC Internal Trading, that can be found in our document library. Of course, he puts that up there. And Judge Netburn is therefore ordering the SEC to stop stonewalling, hand over the policies governing SEC employees, whether they're trading in, purchase of, sale of digital assets and or virtual currencies, including all changes and updates to those policies on the defendants. So that thing's pretty pretty cool. And you can see the sort of the, I'm actually in a weird way, sort of enjoying this because it's a, uh, it's sort of like a little, it's, it's sort of like a teachable lesson here, right? Goliath comes after David. David's like, you know, the ripple in this thing is going to do the battle. And there's the behemoth SEC with, I think, Rosalind Layton had mentioned it earlier today. They have something like 200 the million, billion, whatever, they're, whatever they're, they, they have basically unimaginable uh, sort of resources. They're unending resources, right? They're not like, like well, we're on a budget here, man. So we just got to hire the right attorney. No, 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 no. No, that's out the window. So they have these unlimited resources. They can go ahead and do anything they want here, right? But look what's happening. Oh, all of a sudden, the whole fair notice thing, they're afraid of that. They want to quash that. They want to quash the deposition. Why? You got nothing to hide? Bring it on. That's what I say. Bring it on. Look everywhere. We got nothing to hide. It said it's notable that the court presided by Magistrate Judge Netburn already granted two discoveries to Ripple. So the latest one was a third discovery. But here's the problem is the SEC is kicking and fighting the whole entire way, right? They, uh, they're like, well, uh, yeah, I mean, whatever. As if they're just going to ignore it. It's like they said to give it give it away. And like, no, they didn't. Yeah, they, the judge said it again. No, they didn't. And so here it is, third time. So further of great significance, in a recent interview with Bloomberg, the SEC commissioner, Hester Pierce, famously, um, now as a crypto mom, told the magazine, from which here she's formerly known as Crypto Mom, because Ripple with the CEO Brad Garlinghouse and co-founder Chris Larson is alleged of selling XRP as security does not make it a security by nature, right? She talked more about how it might be packaged, how that might have been changed, and it's sort of a different sort of a manner there. Yeah, this is a good point right here. Van Life Biker, what's going on? On one of three of you, hit that like button. Guys, if it's your first time here, hit the like and subscribe button. Best way you can help us out, Jeff and I, is to share this video, get us out there. Um, and we certainly uh, appreciate that, no doubt. And I wanted to jump into another story here, if I can locate it. That's another more of the same. Yeah, so we, <laughs> so here's here's what I find quite interesting. You know, one of the things we always talk a lot about on this channel is your money, your rules, right? Because nobody knows how to spend your money better than you. But who thinks they got a little piece of this? Who thinks they're smarter than you? Governments do, right? They think they should be like a nanny state telling you all the time what you should be able to do. Oh, this is volatile. Oh, this is dangerous. Hey, walking out of your house is dangerous. Could get hit by a bus. Could get hit by a car. A tree branch can fall on you. And that happened in two cities over. Person was walking along one day, tree branch fell, done. You know, no one expects that to happen, but all kinds of crazy stuff can happen. But here's what I find interesting here. Look at this. Interestingly, some 401k plans may start offering cryptocurrency as an investment option. Here's why that's a bad idea. Okay. Now, Kind of have to laugh on this, right? So, what are they gonna? What are they gonna possibly say 
that it could potentially be a bad idea. Well, let's take a look. So here is the first thing they're going to say. Now, they didn't lead. I mean, I got to commend them a little bit because they didn't lead with it's nefarious and there's bad actors because that's like the button. Nefarious, bad actors. Okay, what else do you have? They said cryptocurrency is an unstable form of a virtual currency. Really? Sounds like a lot of opinion there. Unstable how? Because Bitcoin drops. Bitcoin's outperformed the S&P 500, the NASDAQ. It's a, in the last 10, 11 years running, it's outperformed most of them. So they say it's it's unstable, it, it's but it's the hot new investment craze. Should employees offer Bitcoin and its brethren an option in the workplace retirement plans? I don't know. What, you, what do you guys think about that? I mean, is this something you'd love to see? Let's suppose you're working, you have a 401k. Usually if you're not outside, if you're outside the USS, it's a retirement plan, which allows usually, it's usually through your employer. And what it allows you to do is to contribute uh, so much per um, per week, actually per month, but it's pre-tax. So what they do is they take that out before they tax you. So if you put a hundred bucks away a week, or a hundred bucks, or two hundred dollars a month, it comes out pre-tax. Now, what usually happens with a four hundred one k, a lot of companies will match what you put in up to a certain percentage. Sometimes they'll match it up to three percent. Sometimes they'll match it up to five percent. And sometimes it's the, the matches all depend. And that's one of the perks of working at an organization or a company. But part of it is, is that it's your retirement plan. You decide exactly what you're going to be investing in. Most of it's in stocks. Some of them offer precious metals. But the key part here to remember is your money, your choice. So you go in online or you work with an advisor who represents the organization. And it's usually done by a third party. It's never done by the company you work for. And what they do is they they can advise you, but normally um, I I've got, you go in there, you select a couple of things, maybe you diversify, maybe I'll put 30% here, another 30%. You see it go up and down and you can basically move it around. You start seeing a dip in the market, you throw it into fiat or something stable, like uh, perhaps like uh, precious metal, if they offer it, that's how they work, right? What they're, what they're asserting here is that they, man, they just don't think you're smart enough to really work with your own money. And uh, for us all, which I have to applaud, they're a 401k retirement plan. They think it's a great idea. And so what they did was they went ahead and partnered with Coinbase um, on their institutional crypto platform. And they're going to be able to offer employers the option of offering cryptocurrency in their plans. I think this is a great idea. Now, they do have IRA plans, which are individual retirement accounts. This is a little bit different in the sense that you can always have an IRA, but the 401ks are usually a little bit different the way they're set up. IRAs also have limits as well. And if you have an IRA, um, there's a couple of them out there right now that allow you to invest in cryptocurrencies. So he makes a really good point. For too long, too many Americans haven't had the same access to alternative investments that the wealthy professionals have had. And this is uh, Jeff Schulte. Uh, he's the CEO of For Us All. And he said in a statement, and I love this statement. Why? Because what have we been hearing a lot about? Oh, JP Morgan going to offer Bitcoin to who? To you? The little guy? No. They're wealthy Pete. They're wealthy in investors. And this is all the big banks, right? We've all gotten wind of this, that they're going to be able to provide this to the wealthy. Not you. No, 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 no. And I'm not saying you're not wealthy, but I'm just saying the big, big, a small elite part of them. What he's trying to do here, what Jeff is, uh, Schultz is trying to do here is saying, hey, too long, too many have suffered. So under the four, uh, us all offering, employees could elect to transfer up to 5% of the retirement balances into a secure account. Now, this would allow them to buy, hold, sell more than 50 cryptos. Company said it would monitor employee allocations, alert them when their uh, overall crypto allocation exceeds the, the threshold. Now, let's think about the title of this article. Why it's a bad idea. Why would putting 5% of a diversification, they're not talking about 50, they're not talking about 75, they're not even talking about 100%. They're talking about 5%. And whoever wrote this article, well, that's a bad idea. That's a horrible, bad idea. Here's this from Rob McDermott. He says, my crypto portfolio has destroyed the gains from mine and my wife's 401ks. Same here. Um, by destroyed, I mean hundreds of percent and that's not even reached my expectations. My Edward Jones guy stopped calling me. Because, you know, he calls you up. He's like, hey, Rob, 
Um, I want to talk to you a little bit. You're like, hang on a second. Hold my beer. I'm doing 600% in this one. I'm doing 1,100% in this one. What, what you got? You have the ARC funds? No. What do you have? I got like a 6% gain. Okay, see you later. And he hangs up on him, right? So this is a great story, Rob. Thank you for sharing that with us because it's so spot on. Here you go. Here's another one. Traditionally, high volatility markets are a no-go for store of wealth, regardless of return on investment. It's usually a hedge against inflation. And in the long run, why gold um, is choice. Yeah, that's true. But again, you know, if you're only allocating a very small percentage of it, why would you have to be uh, making that decision for somebody else? If it's their fund and their retirement, unless you think they're just stupid and they're not smart enough to be able to choose. We're not talking about converting the whole thing. You're bringing up a good point there, um, JB, but it's also possible. I mean, and so it says professional investors have been shifting more of their investments to alts. And right there, the point shouldn't be lost. Any company considering facilitating this option for workers. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole article, but here they talk about you should be, there's no reasonable expectation of profit over time. Um, speak to my pal, Rob McDermott, and speak to some other people that I know that are destroying it, as he says. Crypto fails in that regard. So, yeah, you get some professional who's smarter than everybody else. Uh, many people don't understand the technology. That's true. However, many of the people that don't understand the technology happen to be in the government, right? They're the ones that are making decisions for us too. They're supposed to be representing us, but they don't understand the technology, but that's okay. Not a problem. They've amassed wealth beyond anybody's expectations on a meager salary. Nobody knows why, but somehow they get insider information. Somehow they know what the place to bet's on. But don't worry. You don't know how to take care of yourself. Enthusiasts of crypto uh, tech believe it will one day revolutionize the way people transact business online. They say this almost like it's a pipe dream. It's happening now. It's not one day. It's happening now. I mean, Ripple's proved it, right? They set the rails up. Um, why don't you call up MoneyGram and ask them how the loss of sending remittances down to Mexico, how that felt when their chief tech officer chimed in and said, yeah, we don't have anything to replace it with. He said, why don't you just replace it with someone else? They're like, nah, we have just really nothing to replace it with. And people say, well, what about XLM? What about this and that? What they don't, what they forget about, and HBAR and, and a lot of great, great, you know, alts out there. Here's the thing: on-demand liquidity. You can say it with me: ODL, on-demand liquidity. That's full remittance, three to four seconds. Boom, it's there. There's no like um, hesitation. And this is what a lot of them don't bring. They also don't have the rails set up to be able to achieve this. Cryptocurrency is volatile. Oh no. Well, that's cool because the stock market isn't that volatile. I mean, I know gold, precious metals aren't. They kind of go up, but they're artificially sort of kept in check. I think they're very, very undervalued. Gold really ought to be 30, 35,000. There's a limited supply of it. And the fact that it hovers around below 2,000 is, is kind of crazy in my estimation. And non-professional investors shouldn't speculate, but don't worry. It's okay if you're playing the stock market because a company that has is holding a tremendous amount of debt. If you look at, you know, this is the thing you get the prospectus, and you can look at their debt. Look at their debt. Look at what kind of shape they're in. Look at exactly what their growth levels look like. Look at what companies they've acquired, and then tell me if their stock holds up under the price. Sounds like uh, going to Vegas, and it sounds like you're playing the at a casino because it doesn't always hold up. But that's okay. It's an agreement we've all sort of bought into. And we're like, that's cool. It doesn't really have any leg to stand on, but let's keep raising money because what are they returning to the shareholders? Um, what kind of profits are they? Oh, they're losing money. You know, I looked at a company not too long ago. They looked great. You know, their you know, their whole presentation looked great. But when you started looking behind the curtain over there at Oz, you started seeing the little guy that are pushing buttons, and you're like, hey, it was startled. He was like, Well. You start seeing the debt. You start seeing that the 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 debt they're holding, the paper, all kinds of bad stuff happening. You're like, uh, yeah. You close that curtain. You move on. But that's okay. We have an agreement that we're all going to be cool with that. And that's the funny part of that is everybody has um, these reasonable expectations about what you may or may not um, get a hold of, right? So I, I find that to be funny as hell. Look at this right here. So Ron Tully says it's the government trying to prevent the have-nots becoming the haves. Now, that's an interesting statement, right? Because 
They want you to do well, but don't go, hey, listen, pal, don't go crazy. We don't want you succeeding, like, amazingly. We just want you to just kind of just keep your head above water enough to cover your taxes. You know, maybe go out once a month, whatever it is. And it's a good point, Ron, because they don't want you getting too further ahead. But don't worry, because uh, other officials in the government, like in Congress, they're going to be okay. Yeah. There's another point, too. You say, well, 401k should generally be conservative towards retirement, generally. That's true. Um, I was never that uh, conservative and when it comes to investing money bags. But you're right. Generally, you want to be conservative. But what if you diversify? What if 80% of your portfolio or 90% of your portfolio is in good, sound investments, uh, maybe some precious metals, but maybe some of it is in a high growth? And maybe that high growth starts outperforming your conservative. So maybe it's sort of specific, you know, diversification is always going to be a good thing. Um, yeah, here's, uh, let me see what else we got here. There's another one I wanted to play. Here's the one right here. Hans Lode, he says, Chip, the low-key conspiracy theorist. I don't know how low-key I am. I just know that I hold back a lot. And um, there's certain things that you can get away with saying, certain things you probably don't want to say. So I don't know how, how uh, low-key I am. Um, and Berserker, or Hans Lode says, yeah, you're right. I mean, sometimes, but, you know, there it is. Chip, the patriot. Yeah, we're all patriots when it comes to looking out for each other. We're looking out for our own bottom line because why? We work hard, right? Want to keep as much of our money. And one of the big issues that we see here is the fact that you have this central banks uh, who are have created a system. It's an awesome system. A great gig if you can get it. Central banker, yes, yeah, so you loan money to this so-called sovereign country. You loan them a, a dollar but they now have to borrow $2 because then they have to pay the interest. Imagine that. It doesn't matter what country it says or what it says on the actual bank note or the fiat currency. It, where is it coming from? Yeah, it's coming from a central bank. Debt. This whole system is built on debt. And that's why the house of cards cannot sustain. And usually the system lasts 40, 50 years. But some cases it can last a little bit longer. So I thought that one was a little bit uh, insane. So now we're going to jump to a little bit of tech here because the company that I really have a, a lot of respect for, and it's somebody who very early played in the um, in the uh, XRPL space, and that is not, none other than the Puma browser. Um, this is Puma. They put this tweet out today. It's a really great tweet. Search is something deeply personal, and, and we should focus on uh, making you happy, not the advertisers. Now, if you guys aren't familiar with the Puma browser, the Puma browser is phenomenal. It's one of the ones that I've, you, I've basically been using it since it came out, and I've seen it grow. Now, what's cool about it is that if you have a Coil account, by the way, if you're watching this right now with the Coil account, thank you. Why am I thanking you? Because you are streaming micropayments of XRP right now to on the chain. How do I know that? Every night, Jeff and I, we see, receive an email that says, hey, you received this amount of, uh, of, of XRP. Now, it doesn't say who it's from, but I know it's from you with the Coil account. And if you're holding a Coil account, once you plug that into the browser, you're done. There's no plugins. You go ahead and you put your, your um, you, you, you basically log in. And so if you're watching it on your phone, you use the Puma browser and it's streaming those micropayments. And what's really cool is in the corner of the phone, you can actually see those little ticks, those little droplets that are that are going. So that's one of the reasons I love Puma. I love the, the company over there, and I love what they're doing. And this is something I thought I'd alert you guys to. Um, that's where we're really excited to share it, and we partnered with the Neva team. Now, they both put a blog post out on it, and I wanted to go to Neva here. Neva provides integrated search options to Puma. This is a privacy-focused uh, uh, browser, something we talk an awful lot about, Jeff and I here, and there's, they're talking it from their perspective. They're pleased to go ahead and partner with Puma. Fast private mobile web browser, an ad-free internet ecosystem. That's why they use Coil. Uh, easy to support creators, game app developers, charities. Neva, Puma, uh, like Neva, Puma is committed to creating a service that's private and ad-free. So that's one of the things. Let's go back here. Um, 
I said we met about uh, a year ago, the rest of the team. Um, it's been amazing to see what they've built in such a very short period of time. Now, what's cool about this, you guys might find this a little bit interesting. Like this one, I found a little bit, I'm kind of taken back a little bit by this. So I go look at this and I say, oh, who is who is Neva actually? Search reimagine. We've seen a lot of stuff come out on the blockchain, but you're like, okay. So there's DuckDuckGo. There's a lot of things that really are, you know, the Brave browser, which I'm using right now, that you can set it to sort of protect your privacy, get rid of cookies, any kind of trackers. But if you look at Neva right here, check this out. Created by ex-Google executives. Now, who tracks the daylights out of you, right? Who, and Neva says it gives you a private ad-free search experience. So basically you go in here, throw up your email and here's what it looks like. Hey, did you know that 40% of your search results are actually ads? You know, you're looking for something, you look, 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 click, click, click. You know, the funny thing is if you're an ad, if you're an advertiser and you have the ad on top that you're paying for and your result comes up in the very first result, if people click on the top, you just paid for that, even though it came up in the search result. You'll see this very often when you're looking for stuff. And with um, it's 100% real with Neva. All you're, all you're doing is getting results. Why? Because they're not making any money based off of advertising. And um, they block all the trackers. It's very similar to what Brave does. They block all the trackers. They've got a bill of rights. This is something we've been calling for for a long time, a bill of rights, right? We need a digital bill of rights um, the same way there's one in the U.S. for the country. It basically is a core set of privileges that every American shares, right? And they talk about privacy, reasonable data collection and controls, know how your data is used, your data ownership and portability. And also uh, a company like Permission.io, where they're doing something revolutionary in the sense that they say, well, like, hey, if you're okay with how you wanna share your data, why would you let a third party benefit from that? Why don't you benefit from that yourself? And you set the controls of how that actually works with you. So I find this to be really cool. I always like more and more of these things coming in here. It's cool that it's a bunch of ex-Googlers that founded it. And it says, uh, do you get generic results when you search? We let you pick the news sources you trust and the retailers you love. Because what it, what always happens? Who is trust? Who is picking these so-called trusted news sources, right? You know what it's like to search for crypto. And what comes up? The paywalls. You ever notice that? You do a search for a particular story. You're looking for something about XRP. They have a new partnership with somebody and what do you find out oh it's the it's the you know the usual suspects there right the ones that basically do advertising you know like no 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 i i want a different source there's sources that i like and i trust maybe it's not these other sources over here so they let you pick them um brave does to an extent as well too and um but i think i love new tech like this um there's the team right there these are the experts obviously there's the ex president of uh the g there's the ex-SVP of G Search. There's uh, the CEO and co-founder, ex-SVP, and the uh, ex-VP at G, right? So what does that tell you? Four of them that got together and said, hey, we can do this better. We can do something different. They got a whole story that I'm not really necessarily going to get into. But again, guys, check this out. It's at Neva, N-E-E-V-A.com. I'll drop it in the chat. Check it out. Also, the Puma browser, if you're not using it on your mobile, it's available on iOS and Android. And um, I personally love it, use it all the time, especially because of Coil. And I like to, um, I like to uh, basically, if I'm watching YouTube, unfortunately, it's never on a desktop. If I'm watching on desktop, I've got a Chrome plugin for Coil, but it may not always be the case. Sometimes I'm watching on my phone and I want to support other creators. Name all the creators in the space, especially in the XRP space. Um, they're all using a coil additive. So that's why it's really nice. You want to support creators and kind of spread it around. That's a really nice way to do it. I highly recommend that. Let me go back to the chat here. Let's see what we got here. Let's see what we got in the chat here. We have do 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 vlogs and yeah, man, berserkers in here. We need more cowbell. Yeah, right here. And there's um I need to say in our rights, which they're determined to erode. Yeah, that's something, right? There you go. That's something right there. And um, Alex D popped in here with the super. And um, is it on here, man? No, it, or, there it is right there. Bam, there it is. Alex D vlogs. You guys don't aren't subscribed to his channel. If you want to get positive vibes, if you want to get be upbeat, if you want to catch someone who's got the energy, 
Go check out Alex, man. Let's go chip XRP to the moon. Her name is on the money. And, of course, he's probably talking about Rosie Rios, right? But there you go. Um, her name is also on the money as well. But thank you for that, Alex D. Go sub Alex D. Vlogs. And uh, I'd love to sign off at once, at least with your sign off. It's patented. It's your sign off. But I think it would be so much fun to do. And if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, you got to go check out one of Alex D. Vlogs and uh, one of his videos. And you will soon know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, we talk about the mass adoption. We talk about everybody getting into the game. Well, you know, it's kind of funny because a lot of the naysayers, the boos, the oohs, all those kind of people that were like, oh, cryptocurrencies. Well, here's one of them. Citigroup. They just launched the digital asset unit within its wealth management division. Oh, really? Huh. That's kind of weird. You don't say wealth management, huh? Let's get into this. Wall Street giant Citigroup officially launched a new business. Oh, uh, here comes a, geez, speaking of privacy, sponsored by, there was a sponsored something in there. A uh, new business unit dedicated to cryptocurrency and blockchain space, according to a memo obtained by the block. The firm announced Thursday morning, the new group dubbed the Digital Assets Group, which will sit within its wealth management division. And isn't that interesting? Wealth management division, huh? There it is. And that's exactly what we were looking at with that 401k story. Given the new exciting developments we're seeing around crypto tokenization and other advances powered by blockchain, we're pleased to announce the formation of the Digital Assets Group. There's a, there's a creative name. So again, you have start to see more and more of the big banks. Here's the wealth unit, right? Again, we're looking at who are they going to be able to support? The wealthy, right? So... But if they, what if they bring it down to your level? What about you, buddy? You don't know how to handle your money. Too volatile. You might get hurt. Wait, but I'm only investing 5%. It's a bad idea, right? That's how they get, do with this whole thing, man. Look at Rob McDermott with the big 19, man. Nine. Thank you. Appreciate that. Great content and show tonight, Chip. No need to read and share my donation. Keep it up. Well, that's a little bit too late, but we read them all here because we're very grateful, Jeff and I for it and really much appreciated because you know what jeff and i know you guys work hard you guys earn it and you earn it every single day you get out of bed you earn everything you close your eyes at night no you did a great job so thank you for that and so when we start talking about the mass adoption yeah everyone's flying into the field yeah now it's okay but it's okay for the wealthy so when when they finally make it available to the little guys you know us they start making it available you start seeing all the well, it's uh, it's bad actors and it's uh, volatile and it's uh, and you're gonna really crush yourself and it's gonna be a bad idea, right? All over now. This right here, I have to get into a little bit because one of my favorite people is Fred Wilson. If you guys don't know who Fred Wilson is, he is a pioneer. But I want to throw let's start this right here on screen. Let me show this up here. I put this up here. Fred Wilson is a VC. He's a venture capitalist. He's also a husband, father, three amazing people, a blogger, a music fan. He, you know, he's a regular person. What he does, he records his thoughts here and he talks about people. He talks about things that he wants to do and all this other stuff. And I wanted to, yeah, I want to check out his Twitter too. His Twitter is uh, excellent too. If you guys aren't following him, let's see, did I, did I switch, click his Twitter? Huh. Yes, he doesn't have his Twitter hooked up. Never mind. But anyway, I want to get into this blog post he wrote because I think it's really interesting from a phenomenal perspective. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hey now. Whoa, Alex D. What's up, man? Thank you so much, brother. Appreciate that. Chip to the moon. XRP. Thank you, guys, man. Amazing support. Appreciate that. And um, I, I like where this is coming from because venture capitalists, right? Coming from a different perspective, but look at the title on this. And if I asked you, what do you think this article is about? Regulating software, right? Kind of catches a little bit off guard, like Chip, why are we looking at this? Let's run a little bit deeper on this. I understand that regulators and elected officials need to raise concerns about new technologies and their impact in society. It's their job or at least part of their job, but I'm also dismayed regularly how poorly, how poorly many elected officials and regulators understand the technologies they're talking about. Are we on point here? Are you guys there? This is phenomenal, right? Well, what kind of software is he talking about? Well, in particular, I'm deeply concerned about how poorly 
um, these elected officials and the regular regulators understand blockchains, smart contracts, decentralized applications and organizations. They assume that these things are run by companies and people can be regulated with traditional corporate regulatory activities. This one of the things I love about Fred Wilson is he says a lot with a few words. His posts are never that long, but do they hit home and say a lot? They assume that these things are run by companies and people that can be regulated with traditional corporate regulatory activities. That right there is the money statement in here. They assume, assume, you know what assume means, right? When you assume you make an ass out of you and me. That's what assume means. And what people need to understand is that blockchains, smart contracts, decentralized applications and organizations they're not companies, they're software, and they can do or run any company operating them, right? So what he's really trying to uh, trying to establish here, anybody that's reading this article, is he's trying to get at the whole idea that decentralization is just that. Now, how would you explain decentralization? Well, we would go into a different thing. Well, decentralization means that it operates on its own, blah, 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 a lot of technical jargon. What he's saying here is decentralization is running by itself, doesn't need companies, doesn't need an organization if it's true, decentralized. Then he gets into this. He says their software, they can run without any company operating them, right? XRPL doesn't need anybody's interference, right? Ethereum, you know, name it. Let's look at Bitcoin. There's no Bitcoin Inc. There's no company to sue. Founders unknown, they may not exist. So she can't be sued either. There's nobody to call before Congress. AMMs are smart contracts. Smart contracts operate liquidity pools that allow for decentralized trading assets without any company uh, operating them, controlling them, managing them. One of the software programs are published on decentralized blockchain. They just keep running without any intervention by anyone. This is a very good explanation. He said, I can go on and on, but I expect you to get the point. Now, he's talking to a different audience. A lot of people who read Fred Wilson know him as a famous venture capitalist but he's a real, true, spoken, uh, average guy that is above average when he comes to conveying ideas. He says, so when somebody says that one or more of these decentralized software, and I like these calling it software, it was funny because John Deaton said something very similar today and last night where he talked about it being code, right? Software is code. So when someone says that many or these decentralized software applications needs to be regulated or God forbid, shut down, I wonder what the heck are they talking about? I don't even get what that means. Of course, using decentralized technology could be deemed illegal in places. I fully expect that what we'll see happen, but it won't happen everywhere. And the places that embrace these new technologies will benefit immensely from them. So like criminalization of alcohol and gold, these approaches eventually fit, will fail and they'll harm the regions that try it relative to the regions that embrace it. Man, so much power in this article. And I read Fred Wilson all the time, but when he nailed it, he nailed it. This is some of the thing that I like to see an NFT be made of because he told, you can put it up on the wall, you can frame it, and it totally says everything you want it to say. Now it says, I believe the more productive path for regulators and elected officials is to take the time to understand how this stuff actually works, I hope, and think about new ways that society can mitigate the risk while gaining the benefits. That's a harder path but a better path. That's it. That's the whole article. That is powerful. And I want to put it down there. If you guys want to sub to uh, subscribe to uh, to Fred Wilson, you certainly could do that. I'll throw it down here. If you guys want to read this one, I think it's a great one. You want to share it with somebody who's maybe not so tech savvy, somebody who's like, you know, I don't really get digital assets or I don't understand what, what's the whole hubbub about SEC getting sued. I just don't understand it. Right. Holy cow, look at this right here. Alex D, what is going on? I just want to make a vlog saying XRP, XRP, XRP. Let's go, Chip. Wow, I love that, man. That is awesome. You do it, man. You make that blog. I'm there all day long. And so, you know, Fred Wilson, when he makes these like, when 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 Fred Wilson comes up with this stuff, you know, more people are going to look at it. You say like, well, I don't know who Fred Wilson is. I mean, who is this guy? Nobody really knows who he is. Well, he founded something called Union Square Ventures. Um, and I want to get into a little bit about New York. I want to get so you guys know a little bit who they are. He was early into Twitter, Tumblr, Foursquare, Zynga, Kickstarter, Etsy, Mongo, D DB, which is Mongo database. He sees trends before they happen. He catches stuff um, before it's out there. 
And the fact that he's been writing this little um, blog for the longest of time is just phenomenal. And Fred Wilson is, um, he's a giant in the industry. Man, really love what this guy's up to. And I'll show you, um, I want to go to, do, 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 do. I was going to show you some more of investment. but you guys kind of get the idea though. He's a giant in the industry. He really is somebody that you put a lot of stock into. Um, as far as following what he's into and what he's investing in, and I'm trying to look for, I wanted to find some more of his, uh, here it is right here. Boom, 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 boom. Is that it? Uh, Union Square, what else did he have here? Yeah, also uh, Coinbase, I believe, too, early investing. But again, um, he's he's a superstar. But if you guys want to take a closer look at that, share that with your friends because they'll sort of understand what, what exactly goes on um, when somebody from a different perspective is looking at it, someone like a Fred Wilson from Union Square Ventures, someone who is a um, basically a giant man. And uh, the best thing I can tell you guys here is that Jeff is going to be back when? Oh, that's a mystery. I'm not going to tell you exactly when he's going to be back. He's going to be back very soon. But, um, but, but, but here we go. Here's what I wanted to show you guys. So here you go. Here's some... Uh, Here's some of the brands that they've invested into right there. There's a thesis 2.0, Twilio, Meetup. These are all DuckDuckGo, Coinbase, Protocol Labs, 2016. Y'all, we also know the Brad Garlinghouse, investor in Protocol Labs, that came out. Thesis 1.0, Etsy, Meetup, Twitter. These are all superstars in their own right, right? You're looking back 2007, SoundCloud, lots of different organizations. And this Fred Wilson nailed it right on the head exactly. So this is Thursday night. What happens on Thursday night? Well, that means that we sort of close out the week, kind of, but we're back on Saturday mornings. Jeff does a stream on Saturday morning, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., uh, which is Miami time. And on Miami time, it means that if you guys are overseas, that means you guys can catch this afternoon, which you probably won't because you're going to be super busy doing cool stuff with your families and getting outside or doing whatever you're going to do. And <laughs> that's... And that's absolutely fine. But if you haven't subscribed to us, subscribe. Uh, click that notification bell. That way you know we broadcast live Sunday through Thursday, 8 p.m. to 9 p.m., 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. on Saturday mornings, basically six days a week. And uh, that's pretty much all I have right now. Um, shout out to Jeff if he's still out there. Shout out to all of you. Thank you guys so much for the support tonight. Jeff and I really appreciate it. It means a lot to us. And the fact that you guys show up time and time again, you're the faithful, you're the OTC family, and Jeff and I, we love you, man. So keep coming back. We'll get back together again Saturday morning. If you don't make it Saturday, show up back here on Sunday. We're going to have another exciting week. That's all I got for right now, and I will see you on the next one. Have a good one, guys. Are you down with OTC? Please like, subscribe, and click the bell to be notified when the next video drops.